Welcome to Honest HR, the podcast for informed and aspiring HR professionals intent on transforming workplace challenges into golden opportunities. Every week, we chat with industry experts to bring you insights, trends, and actionable advice through relatable stories from the real world of HR. Honest HR is a SHRM podcast, and by listening, you're helping to build a more engaged workforce and drive organizational success. I'm Wendy Fong. I'm Amber Clayton. And I'm Monique Akanbi. Now, Now, let's let's get get honest. honest. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm your host, Amber Clayton, Senior Director of SHRM's Knowledge Center Operations. In our episode today, we're going to discuss the technical competency, HR expertise, employee and labor relations. This podcast is approved to provide 0.5 PDCs towards SHRM CP and SHRM SCP recertification if you listen to the full episode. Today, we're going to talk about political activities in the workplace. I recently had a podcast with Emily Dickens and Derek Sheets on political conversations in the workplace. This one's a little bit different, though. These are activities that happen in the workplace, and HR professionals, employers, they need to know how to manage them. One of the questions that we've gotten from our members in the Knowledge Center is that they would like to provide tools and resources for their managers to help them deal with any tensions or issues that may occur during the upcoming election. What do they need to be prepared for? Also, how can they prepare employees who interact with customers? And so today we're going to talk about these various activities and issues that may result from politics. I'm pleased to be joined today by Rue Dooley and Jennifer Chang, both HR Knowledge Advisors at SHRM. Welcome to the show, Rue and Jennifer. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, great. So um, Rue, I feel like you've been on a podcast previously. Is that right? Yes. Yes, I have. Yep. I thought so. So you're not new to this game, but could you still tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Not much to tell because there isn't much to me. I'm just just an old man trying to figure out how to retire without any money. Um, I've been a knowledge advisor for about uh, 23 years. And... um, I have a background in knowledge advising and (laughs) and I love HR and I love serving our members. It it feels great to be able to answer um, questions about what's going on in the human resource community every day of my life. That just feels good. Jennifer. Thank you, Amber. Uh, Well, I have only been a knowledge advisor for three years. Um, Prior to that, I worked as an HR director in government contracting, and I did take some time off to raise my daughter, which was wonderful. Um, But working as a knowledge advisor is amazing. I love being able to help our members like Rue does um, and just really impact work for everyone. So that's awesome. Great. Well, thank you both. I think we should just go ahead and jump into this topic here. So we know employers have to deal with various issues at work. And this time of year, we're in a presidential election year. There's a lot happening. We talked in my last podcast episode around civility in the workplace and having civil conversations. And we'll touch briefly on that one. But really, I want to focus on some of those activities and things that happen that employers might not be aware of or that might be happening right now and how to deal with those issues. So let's start with this one. Employee requests time off to work the voting polls. What do employers do? Are they required to allow the person to take time off to work at the voting polls? And is it something that has to be paid or is it unpaid or can they use their vacation time, their sick time? What What do you think about that? Yeah, Jennifer, what do you think about that? <laughs> I know you're going to do that. <laughs> I think it depends on state regulations. Um, many states do allow time off for voting. Um, but an employer would really want to look at the regulations to see if they also require and allow time off to work um, in that civic capacity as a um, a poll worker. Um, they would really want to look at the regulations to see uh, if the time off is allowed for working um, at the polls themselves. So Beyond that, an employer could also just provide the time off as part of their company policy. They could um, offer paid time off for that 
uh, in addition to their normal paid time off, that's part of their core values um, to be that civic minded, or they could allow an employee to use their paid time off and supplement that time with that pay if they wanted to. So if the state doesn't require the employer to provide time off for employees for working at the polls, really, they could say no. It could be disruptive to the business, right? They could. They could. That's certainly one answer that's available. (laughs) Rue, did you have any other take on that? Yeah. I mean, it could be uh, disruptive to some organizations. It would be rare. And in our country in the United States of America, that is, um, because di- different rules apply different places. But since we're talking about the elections e- here this year, um, you know, I would encourage most employers who can and most can to 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 be flexible about allowing people time both to vote and to to work in most states and environments and 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 organizational cultures, um, people want you to vote anyway. And in our country, it's, you know, it's your civic duty. So go ahead and ask for the time if you're not already provided the time. Um, In some states, they say, hey, look, your employer has to give you a couple of hours off if, you know, your shift starts, um, you know, during voting hours. Well, that's actually something I wanted to talk about was the state laws and the time off to vote and the use of PTO. And Jennifer, you mentioned that state laws vary on this. And that's a question that comes up pretty frequently in the Knowledge Center is, you know, how much time do I have to give off for someone to vote? And um, how do I verify that they voted or can I verify that they voted? Um, You know, what, what type of advice or guidance would you give to employers with those types of questions? Well, as to Rue's point, I really do think employers should be encouraging employees to do their civic duty. Um, most states do offer time off to vote, and employers can look at those state regulations. Um, typically, it's between two to three hours. Sometimes um, the state will allow employers to require employees to go at the beginning of their shift or the end of their shift so they don't really interrupt operations. Um, But it's certainly very important for everyone, um, regardless of the election season, but particularly this season. So are you saying that employers should encourage voting for who the employer thinks is the best candidate? Uh, No. That happens. (laughs) That happens. We've heard that before from from members where the employer has um, leaned towards one side or the other, and uh, that has become uh, a conflict of, of, you know, for the employees. So how, how would you recommend an employee, you know, to either deal with that or an employer, you know, who wants to be able to say, you know, this organization is Republican and we want to vote for this candidate. Rue, you want to take that one? Sure, sure. L- let's go straight to the heart of the matter. Everybody gets to, this is what makes um, democracies work is that everybody has uh, their way of seeing things and their preferred policies passed, right? And so that uh, who they want to represent them, they get to elect. So employers should generally avoid, <laughs> but we, you know, as much as they possibly can, endorsing one side in a political e- election, much less coercing or, or forcing or giving the appearance of forcing or coercing employees to vote for one side or the other. There are a million reasons why they should avoid that. Um, real quickly. Um, I was going to say, don't give me a million. Just no. give me a million. <laughs> I'll just give you one, right? You don't want to alienate employees who hold different views. That's that. We don't need to, to go much further than that. Um, you know, because from that stems a whole bunch of other problems or potential mm-hmm. problems. So um, it could also really risk you know, the the reputation of an organization. So if an organization that satisfies clients or customers or members or whatever from different political belief systems decides it wants to take one political stand, it can alienate your customers, your clientele base, it can affect revenues and, and on and on. I, I told you I wasn't going to give you a whole bunch of reasons. But so what does an employer do instead well, what they do is just 
focus on the civic engagement, focus on the the act of voting itself. And if an employer wants to say, here are our values, here are the things that we value, whatever they happen to be without a political slant, they can always communicate that in their quarterly meetings, their staff meetings, whatever, with employees. And that might provide the education employees need to vote in alignment with company values. So a member question that we received was they wanted to know the rules around sending a political email about abortion to all staff. And we know that was a hot topic over the last couple of years. Uh, Can you talk to us about, uh, you know, what are those rules, if there are any rules about sending political, political emails, either from the employer standpoint or from the employees? So I am interested, Jennifer, in in hearing your perspective on this one. But coming from me, yeah, no, that's not okay. Um, Not that it's unlawful, but it's not okay for a number of reasons. Um, And again, I won't bore you with all of the reasons, but one reason is because it's such a, uh, it can be anyway, such a polarizing topic Mm -hmm. by itself that it isn't if it doesn't have to do if my company makes and sells widgets maybe my company shouldn't be even even if leadership in the organization has a certain opinion maybe my company shouldn't be holding and disseminating opinions about polarizing topics that have nothing to do with the efficient effective development and production of widgets and the selling of these for the purposes of revenue, right? In, in other words, it ain't got nothing to do with what we're doing here. So I should probably keep my um, email to myself. Well, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to beg to differ on this one because again, you know, something like abortion, even if the company has, you know, is making widgets, it's still impacting the people in some way in the organization. And so you know, some employees want their employers to take a position on it or take a stance on it. So, you know, what do you what do you think about that, Jennifer? I think I kind of fall in the middle between the both of you. I think it's important for employers to provide resources to employees, um, education about perhaps what has happened and how it might affect their benefits their time off, you know, to your point last year, a lot of employers were trying to figure out, like, were they really going to give time off for people to go to different states if need be. Um, I also think that we don't want to alienate our employees either, because it is so deeply personal. Um, and just, it's such a personal decision that um, employers also kind of just need to be about the business of doing their business. So kind of give the information, but without taking a stand one way or another, I think might be a good approach. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely tricky. Um, There's no laws or guidance that specifically says employers should do X, Y, Z. And so, you know, they do have to think about their employee population and, um, you know, what they do as an organization. And um, I, I would agree you know, sticking to the resources and being able to provide the information and the guidance without actually saying, you know, no, I don't agree with this or yes, I do agree with it. Um, you know, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but I think when it's coming from the employer, it definitely has a, a, a bigger impact. So Amber, what about public perception? So if I make widgets, right? I want as many people who can be interested in widgets to become interested in them and to buy them. And when they buy them, buy them from me. So if half of the voting population feels a certain way about any polarizing subject, right? And the other half obviously feel the the opposite way, right? Mm -hmm. What is the best thing from a business perspective for me to do as a business leader What is the best thing for me to do with my employees, since we're talking about HR, for my employees? Now, do I say to my employees, given recent legislation, we want you all to be healthy. So here's what our benefits offer, Mm -hmm. and here's how you can best take advantage of them um, and stop there, period, full stop, you know, blank, new paragraph. 
or do I, because I have an opinion, share it in that email? What do I do from a business perspective? What's best for me to do? Because my employees want me to be, as you said, want me to be engaged. Hey, take a position, Rue. You're our business leader. Take a position. And hopefully your position is aligned with mine. What do I do as a business leader? Yeah. I mean, and that's, again, a very good question. And I think you're right. Uh, And again, I would stick to the business aspect of it. I think if I were going to lose half my business, I'd be concerned (laughs) about relaying that information to uh, to employees or to the population about what you know my personal thoughts or opinions are on a particular polarizing topic. So um, no, but you I definitely totally make the totally the benefits that are available. You you educate your staff about what benefits are available to them mm-hmm. in light of making yes. <laughs> no, I absolutely I agree with you. Okay. So let's let's talk about the legal protections for a second because we've gotten member you know questions and statements. One of them was um, a member who had contacted us and said that he was concerned about an employee who mentioned something political on LinkedIn, mm. and we had another one that said you know it was about a social media post and what what can you put on it, what can you not put on it. The example they provided is that an employee had a Facebook page and had listed where the employee works and the employee put on there their political you know, views and other employees saw it and they got offended and they just didn't know how to handle it. So, you know, the other thing we also hear about is freedom of speech. So talk to me about the legal protections when it comes to uh, freedom of speech, social media, and the National Labor Relations Act, which some people might not be aware applies to their organization. So let's let's talk about those things for a moment. Well, I'll take this one, Rose, since you're making faces. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. That's a humongous question. We could be here for hours. Um, generally speaking, and I am not a lawyer, so don't take my word for this, but generally speaking, to my knowledge, freedom of speech allows us to speak about our opinions about the government without mm-hmm. recourse in most cases. Um, a lot of countries don't have that, and we are privileged to be able to have our own opinions and be able to share them. That does not mean that we get to be mean online without um, some kind of consequence in some situations. So if an employee is online and identifying themselves as an employee of so-and-so company, and they are being disparaging and combative and rude and disrespectful, an employer could potentially have recourse there and ask them to either take that post down or speak in a way about their political beliefs that is civil and respectful. Yeah, that's a good one. It's um, yeah. it, it. The reason I make the faces is because I'm always apprehensive about how to approach this because, you know, the answer could be yes, depending on what exactly is going on, or it could be no. So what I try to do to sort of keep it compartmentalized and to organize my thoughts is I try to remember that the NLRA, National Labor Relations Act, what what it intends to do for my purposes as an HR professional is to protect the rights of employees, both to organize and to discuss, deliberate, contemplate, laugh at, um, tease, um, work conditions. So that always begs the question, what are working conditions? What are they, right? So if an employee wants to talk about um, you know, holes in the wall, they get to do that. Even if they do that on social media, um, no employer wants that. Uh, but there's a certain level of protection that an employee has. When it comes to political um, opinions and employers have to be really careful. So imagine if, especially when we scroll down to, to 
closer to local elections and that kind of thing. So if, for example, my candidate, my favorite candidate is, uh, you know, a, a big union person and I want to push that candidate and I want to talk about um, unions, then yeah, my employer can't can't do too much about that, even though what I'm doing is is from a political slant. And so it, it makes it a, a nebulous area for Rue. So what about, though, in, and thank you for that, um, the NLRA, just one of the things, the misconceptions is that um, people believe that it only applies to union environments or union employers, and that's right. not the case. And so um, that's why I wanted to bring that up, uh, because there is that concerted protective activity, which does include discussion of workplace issues. And oftentimes political issues can be workplace issues as well. So um, you're right. You want to be careful about what type of action you might take as a result of someone posting on social media um, when it comes to politics and workplace issues. But with the legal protections, how about political ideology? Is that something that's protected under federal law? Well, it's not under federal law. But it can be under state law. You are so it depends sharp. on the state. You do that right off the top of your head. Wow. Well, I had that question last week, oh. so <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> but I bet you yeah. couldn't name off all the all the states oh. where that applies. No, I could yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing. I mean, we we are experts in HR in in various ways, but oftentimes we cannot memorize every state or local law uh, that's out there. But we will do the research if we need yes. to. So let, let's talk about campaigning at the work site. That's something that's come up. We've had members who have asked us, you know, um, do we have policies around that or around uh, wearing political attire in the workplace? We've had people ask us if there's um, a policy language for employees who might be running for political office or and not soliciting in the office. Um one happened to say that their employee's campaign office sent an email to all of the coworkers of this person, and it was their work wow. email address regarding their campaign. So Ooh. this, her, she was trying to solicit um, votes from people that she worked with. Uh, we've had people who talk about, you know, clothing, um, buttons, hats. Mm -hmm. We even had a member who called us um, indicating that an employee came in with tape over their mouth and the statement um, about gun violence and the tape on the back said, you know, politicians are useless. Uh, oh. So there's, oh yeah, mask. At the time we were wearing mask, people had slogans, political uh, preferences on there. And so, you know, what, what can employers do when it comes to employees trying to campaign in the workplace, whether it's pamphlet distribution, you know, wearing those buttons, hats, tape over their mouth, you know, what What uh, can employers do in those particular situations? All right. So th that that's a, that's a, another sticky wicket, so to speak, um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, it, what does it boil down to for me? It boils down to, you know, inclusivity and fostering a respectful environment. If we can think from from that backdrop, if we can think from that foundation, how can we be inclusive and foster a respectful work environment for everyone? I think the rules and the policies um, begin to become easier to, to develop and they start to make sense. Uh, so there aren't really laws that are written to say to employers, you can't allow this, you can't allow that, you can't allow this, you can't allow that. Sometimes we wish there were because it would make, it, would make it, it so much easier. It, yeah, it, it, you know, but but there isn't. What what we have is the constitution of the country and then most states have their own constitutions and from that we can say hey, we can do pretty much what we want as long as it doesn't violate something that explicitly says thou shalt not. So, so if we foster a, a, an inclusive work environment and we say, let's make sure that any statements, whether they are um, 
images, uh, t-shirts, um, uh, buttons, whatever, um, any communication that, that we do, let's make sure that it's done respectfully mm-hmm. and make sure we're coming from a place of, of good faith and that we're not trying to impose um, an opinion or a perspective, no matter how strongly we feel about the thing, the workplace is not the place for that. And then we have some formal rules written. Now we can, you know, get down to a more granular level and say, you know, in, in maybe, you know, publicly shared environments. Um, so maybe break rooms and restrooms. Hey, you don't post stuff at all. Nothing. Right. Besides, we want to keep the place looking clean and, you know, but maybe in your own personal cubicle, you can do some things. But, hey, let's not um, let's not have pictures of weapons, for example. Right. Uh, Let's not have pictures that can be disruptive to the workplace or, you know, outright insulting to 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 someone. Well, and I think, too, I mean, I came from retail, healthcare, we always had a dress code policy. Um, The policy required us to not wear shirts with logos or, uh, you know, they had a required uniform in some cases. And so having a a dress code policy can help to avoid those situations or at least manage those situations where employees are coming in and they might have something, you know, on a t-shirt that might be considered inappropriate or offensive. Um, I think more often than not, we probably hear employers, you know, have those policies in place. But, you know, again, the inclusivity, you know, you want to be able to allow employees to bring their whole selves to work. And um, if you can do that without offending or harassing, um, you know, then, of course, you know, do that, do that, but just know how to handle it when it does cross the line. Yeah. So uh, one thing that I want to talk about, too, is participation in protest or riots. I mean, we've had questions from members where they've asked us, you know, should marches or protests be considered a, a paid volunteer day for the employee? Um, they've also asked us, you know, how do you handle it when an employee is part of a protest and let's say they get arrested? So, um you know, what What can employers do in those particular situations? Well, that's a big question. Um, we are allowed to protest. That is our, our right. And if an employee wants time off to do that, then an employer might allow that as long as it's peaceful. You know, if we start acting out and we get arrested, um, that's where it gets really sticky. And an employer could really look at how an employee acted and if it would be um, not offensive, but harmful to the work environment. Um, And they might just look at that on an individual basis. Hopefully it wouldn't happen, um, but it could. And then um, the EEOC has typed out some green factors and they could look at those. It just talks about how the employee's conduct relates to work if it would affect the workplace, how recent it was, all of those kinds of things. Um, but in most cases, attending a protest would not get to that level, I hope. <laughs> we hope, but we know we do hear about that. So, well, we are coming to the end of the episode today. Any last thoughts for our listeners on political activities in the workplace? I think I would just say, at least for the employers and the HR professionals, to look at everyone um, equally. So not favor one political affiliation over another. So if they're going to um, ban certain paraphernalia at work, ban it for everyone um, or welcome it for everyone and just put some parameters around that. So for me, I would say real quickly, I think there are, um, and I say this every day in conversations with members at some point, Three things. You know that you're moving in the right direction when these three things are happening simultaneously. One, you're operating in good faith. You're trying. Two, you're doing what's reasonable to do. Is this reasonable under the circumstances? And three, you're doing what's responsible, making sure that everybody's healthy and safe, right? If you're doing those three things, you're on the right track. Great. Well, thank you again, Rue and Jennifer, for taking part in this episode. You uh, provided some really helpful information. And for our listeners, 
A reminder that this podcast is approved to provide 0.5 PDCs towards SHRM CP and SHRM SCP recertification if you listen to the full episode. After listening, you may enter this activity ID 25WJVRE. Again, that's 25-WJVRE into your SHRM activity portal. Please note that this activity ID will expire November 15th, 2025. And before we say goodbye, I encourage everyone to follow Honest HR wherever you enjoy your podcast. Also, audience reviews have a real impact on a podcast visibility. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to leave a review and help others discover the show. Finally, you can find all of our episodes on our website at sherm.org slash HR daily. Thanks for joining the conversation and we'll catch you next week.